This is something new. I've never done something like this, uh, this particular one. We've done really formal uh, county commission ones in which we had practically a horn honking if you ended up going over your time, but we're not going to do it that way this time. Really kind of wanted to let things breathe. We'll probably uh, look for about a 90 second, maybe two minute maximum. One of the worst things that uh, I think a lot of, a lot of the uh, political conversations we have these days, it's like, okay, we want you to explain everything. And, and you have 20 seconds. And you listen to them spew, and you go, oh, come on. I mean, it's not the way people really talk. Now, if you're going to drag, yeah, we're going to probably poke you along. But uh, I think you two can pretty much handle yourselves. Maybe? All right. So uh, what I was hoping to do is uh, just have uh, the candidates introduce themselves, kind of give a little background, and then we'll go through some questions and see how it rolls and take it from there. All right. And uh, first off, we have Kevin Talbert. Kevin, go ahead. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, thank you, and uh, thanks to the Campaign for Liberty for uh, sponsoring this event, and um, thanks to all of you for turning out. I mean, it is Friday night. You could be at a music event or dinner or a theater or the movies. Or, I mean, there are lots of things to do, but you came out because I guess you care about the future of our county, and, um, and I would say that I have lived in rural Jackson County for 35 years, and the reason I'm running is I care about the county. I care about the future that, that we have. And it's my goal in this campaign to run an optimistic, a positive, a forward-looking uh, campaign that looks at how do we solve the problems of the county? How can we work together to bring our county forward and make it a better place for all of us? So a little bit about my background. I grew up in rural Minnesota on a dairy farm, milking cows, and like a lot of young men, I was really anxious to get off the farm and see the wide world, and fortunately I was able to do that. I ended up uh, at 19 being a Peace Corps volunteer in agriculture and rural development in Nigeria. And then uh, a couple years later I was in the army in Ethiopia. So I spent about three years in Africa in my early 20s and had a chance to see some of the world. I came back, I got an undergraduate degree in political science from the University of Minnesota, and then recruited for action for Peace Corps and VISTA, and later on uh, got a master's degree in college student personnel and a doctorate in higher education administration from the University of Northern Colorado. And then during the last year I was doing that, I came out to the West Coast to backpack on the West Tra Coast Trail, and I discovered public land and mountains and the ocean that you have here in the great, we have here in the great Pacific Northwest, and I said, I, I, I really want to be there. And so I came out here and looked for a job and was fortunate to find one at Southern Oregon University in continuing education, which was Southern Oregon State College then. And continuing education was that part of the university that did things at a university that wasn't the mainstream. It was summer session. It was the conferences and the distance learning programs. It was computer training. It was youth programs. I helped start summer youth programs at Southern Oregon University. And it was senior programs, and I helped start some of those too. And the main difference between me and a lot of people that were at the university was that my job involved getting off campus and talking with people, whether they were teachers or business people or realtors or people that needed some educational component to help improve their jobs. I spent many years on the Workforce Council, I was on the Telecommunication and Technology Council, helped start it as a matter of fact, and I tried to help extend the resources of the university to the community and get involved in the economic development opportunities. But one aspect of being at the university that pertains to my candidacy is that most of the programs that I was involved in were self-support programs. We didn't get any tax dollars. We had to generate the revenues from the proceeds of the program. So we had to market them, we had to meet a payroll of people that had to organize them, and so we had to run a public sector organization like a business and be concerned about efficiencies and being entrepreneurial. So I learned that, and I think that's important thinking about being a county commissioner because many of the operations of the county the airport, the clerk's office, our parks, expo, uh, our, and, and there are others, are all enterprise operations where they have to generate the 
monies that, are, that it takes to operate them. And I think as a commissioner, I'd be able to contribute to help making those operations more efficient and hopefully reducing the tax burden. Um, so some of the things that I'm really concerned about um, for, uh, for the county, I've, I've made economic development and job development the centerpiece of my campaign because that's what I hear people concerned about when I've been out canvassing and I've been talking to people at events. Uh, people want to know that there's opportunity here. And I don't think that the county can solve all of our economic development issues, but the county can be a partner. The county can work with So Ready. The county can work with Chambers of Commerce. The county can work with the Job Council. The county can work with many other organizations, including Rowe Community College, where I've been on the board for 11 years, and Southern Oregon University and the Oregon Institute of Technology to try to prepare a better workforce. And uh, I can work with those 250 or so private businesses that have put money in a pot along with the county and other public organizations to try to recruit and retain the businesses that we have here, provide more jobs. So uh, economic development is very important. Uh, I'm concerned about the balance that we have between uh, public safety and public health, about enforcement versus prevention. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that. And uh, the last thing I'll say uh, by way of introduction is uh, my campaign theme has almost become potholes are not partisan. I'm a registered Democrat running as the nominee of the Independent Party of Oregon against a registered Republican. And I ask everybody in this room, why should it really matter? How many county issues are really partisan? Aren't county issues roads, and public health, mental health, the assessor's office, county planning? How many people that use county services want to be treated in a partisan manner? I would venture almost no one. So why don't we join the majority of Oregon counties and make county commissioner a nonpartisan position? And if I'm elected, I'm going to work for that. I'll stop there. I'm going to look forward to your questions. All right, thank you. Colleen Roberts, a little bit about yourself. Well, I too thank you, uh, Campaign for Liberty, for holding this tonight, for all of you guys coming out. And uh, I just want to say, in the primary, I received the Republican nomination for Jackson County Commissioner Position 3 and the Democrat nomination. And so I figure I represent all of you. <laughs> anyway, so let me tell you a little bit about myself and then why I'm running. Um, I am a native of Southern Oregon, and you want to talk rural? Steve and I live on the top of a mountain in Prospect. <laughs> we are rural. And um, we enjoy living out there where we're a little bit freer, I guess, than living in the city. But uh, Steve and I have been married for 38 years, and we raised uh, three young boys that are grown and have families of their own. And I'm the grandmother of 12 under <coughs> the age of 10. So our uh, gatherings, I've gone to a lot of baby showers <laughs> in the last 10 years. Um, I'm a longtime business owner in Jackson County. I started my business in my home when my children were small, and my sister and I found we could work together and opened a storefront location in 1993, and we've been at it ever since. And we've incorporated and um, done the business plan for up, the ups and downs of our economy uh, for many years. and. Um, I've proven fiscal responsibility and collaboration and effective leadership within a company and within a community. I, uh, over the years, have finished my bachelor's degree in business and a master's degree in business, and so I have proficiencies in dealing with financial statements and budgets and records and um, the many things that, that commissioners are going to have to deal with, just not the running of the company. We have a huge budget, and we have issues in our budget that need uh, common sense answers to it. Um, the issues that I'm running on uh, are threefold. One is the Constitution. I believe at every level of our government, the Constitution has kind of become an archaic um, document. And yet when we go to vote in November, they want to alter that document. So it's important, and it is our protection for our liberty and our freedom. And I will base all decisions within the Constitution. It's, it is valuable. Secondly, of course, our economic development is um, a very important issue. We've seen jobs lost, we've seen businesses close, 
uh, our pay rate is really low. And I have two answers to that. One is our natural resources. It used to be those ONC funds and, and the logging off of our lands it really sustained us financially. And that has been lost to, to federal control. And I will be very uh, adamant at getting that back into county, county management. We don't need to see a city like Weed burn up in Jackson County because of lack of management. Secondly, we need to see jobs come back to Jackson County. And it is my opinion, it is not uh, the county working with So Ready, it's not the county working with RV Cog or Rogue Valley Com Community College or Southern Oregon State University. It's the people that have the ingenuity, that want to start a business, that want to make something tick in this county. They can work with those organizations. And the county and the government needs to get out of the way. And I believe uh, if you fill this room half full with all the state legislation and regulations, that's one thing. The other half is full of county regulations. And those are the ones I want to take a look at, try to remove the restrictions and the, the control off of our ability to do things with our homes, with our businesses, and with our families. And financially, uh, final, finally, uh, transparency and accountability are just so important. And so many think because we have open meeting laws, it just takes care of itself. But if you go to those open meetings, the accountability is not always there, nor is the transparency. And as your county commissioner, I'll see to it that your input is valued, your questions are answered, and that anybody that has a question in our county, they don't feel like it doesn't do any good to go to the meetings or talk to their commissioners. Um, finally, it would just be an honor to serve you as your county commissioner. I am definitely a citizen's representative. I want to represent you, the citizen, in your county government. It's a government of, for, and by the people, not for, of, and by government. And uh, it's a total different stand than what we see in government, and it'd be a pleasure to bring it back to how it's intended to be and to run for the liberty and freedom of each and every one of, of you out there. Okay, thank you, Colleen. All right, we're going to get things rolling here. I'm going to try to keep things at about 90 seconds. It's what I'm going to be shooting for uh, on the answers. And uh, Kevin, you drew first, so you're going to go first on the, on the answer, and then, uh, then you, then we'll bounce it back and forth, and Colleen will go first on the next question, et cetera, et cetera. And why don't we just uh, go right off into the economic situation. There are really two Oregons. We've talked about that for a number of years around here, frankly, from the left and the right. Uh, two Oregons. There's a prosperous northern part and a, uh, uh, a pretty flaccid southern and rural Oregon uh, sort of situation. We've been kind of used to our, our uh, enforced poverty, I suppose. What is your proposal as a Jackson County Commissioner to revitalize the economy? And we have 90 seconds, roughly. So I'm going to fix the Oregon economy in 90 seconds? Is well, at least a, a, okay. a, a, in broad brush strokes. Okay. How about that? <laughs> So let me talk about two areas that I think are really important. And one is our uh, technology available businesses. We have an e-commerce zone here in Southern Oregon. We have uh, an unusually high concentration of technology businesses. Uh, those that, businesses that pay at a, at a rate that is a family wage job. In fact, it pays above a family wage job. And so we have about 250, 270 of those businesses. And we need to bring more of them here, and we need to provide the conditions that will help the businesses that are here to expand and grow. So technology businesses are one, one, one way that, that we can improve our local economy and get Southern Oregon more competitive. And I just want to say one thing. Uh, my opponent keeps talking about natural resources, and I, I, I would just like her to study what the record actually shows. You know, about 25 years ago, the average wage in the forest products industry was about $40,000. This has been studied by a number of economists. The average wage in the technology sector was about $40,000. Well, fast forward 25 years, what's happened? The average wage in the forest products industry is about $40,000. The average wage in the technology industry is about $80,000. So natural resource extraction industries that have been the basis of much that we care about in Southern Oregon are not keeping pace in a competitive global economy. And so we have to look, start looking to other things. 
We want to maintain the forest products infrastructure that we have here. Many people are employed in it. We care about it. It's part of the heritage of Southern Oregon. But we have to look to other alternatives. It's never going to be the way it used to be, Colleen. I wish it could be. So do many people in this room. But the truth is, you can't go back. Things have moved on. And we need to move on. Okay. And yeah, we're, we're at time there. So actually two minutes at that point. So thanks, uh, Kevin. Uh, Colleen, you want to take a couple of minutes, so I'll give you a couple minutes on that. Okay, too. what was the, that's the question again, was about just economic development? Yeah, it had to do with uh, economic development, uh, the two Oregons, and what would you do as a commissioner to re help revitalize the economy in whatever direction? Well, I kind of hit on it again in the introduction um, about government getting out of the way. I think that's my whole mantra. Um, when, you, when you see businesses and they try to open and they are stopped, at every juncture by the government. We heard on the radio, in fact, on Bill's show about a scenic railroad from Butte Falls, and they have, it's, it's like ready to roll. They're, you know what they're stumped by? Government. Land use. And, and land use issues. And uh, a former commissioner, Rick Holt, said the local officials could have a big impact on helping getting this going. And yeah, that isn't the business of yesterday, nor am I wanting the business of yesterday. The management of our lands, though, is a must. We must manage our lands, whether it's a poor paying job or not. There are some people that are willing to do it and love that work. That doesn't mean technologies is the only business that someone can go to work in. It, it definitely is um, a thing of the future, and if there's a market for it, it'll go. Why does, why does the government want to make the market for it? Um, market, free markets take care of themselves, and I'm a free market Republican. It's, it is more than just potholes as a commissioner. It's free markets, and it is... Um, a free way to lead your county by, uh, by moving regulation as much as possible out of the way of progress. And uh, whether you want to do something on your own private property or you want to start a business, you know, I have been blessed. I've been able to start my own business. Could I do it today? I'm not so sure. Will my kids or my grandchildren be able to do that? I sincerely doubt it. Headed the way we're going. Sounds like they better get a technology education. <laughs> you know, a service education. There's just lots of jobs and there's lots of potential. We are not Portland. And um, to have leaders that can lead us, that, um, that see a vision for our county that can make us prosperous again would be really a positive thing. And um, it, I'd love to do it as your commissioner. Okay, right about two minutes. Uh, next question, Colleen, we'll uh, direct this to you first. Be your turn around here. Uh, $300 million budget here in Jackson County, roughly speaking, give her a few, a, a few 10 millions, you know how that goes. Um, what makes you qualified, more qualified, to be able to uh, handle the planning of this budget? Well, um, I have a master's degree in business administration. It is in continuing education. It is in business. I've run a business. I've signed the front of the checks. I've not lived off the government. I've never taken a government check. I've been a creator. I've been managed my own budget, and uh, small as it is, it is frugal and it's fiscally responsible. And I'd be happy to do that same um, frugal budgeting for the county. We need um, we need someone that's willing to look at the numbers, willing to look at the financial statements, the annual financial statements, and the um, the reviews that are online. We had a similar. <laughs> For example, we had a budgeted item for a remodel of an elections office. The contract was for $31,000. When the supplemental budget came in, it came in at $45,000. I said, where's the other $11,000? That is the lack of transparency and the lack of accountability to someone who asks those questions. As your commissioner, I'll account for every penny. And, and as small as that little amount was, it, it's in every department. It's for every budget. And, and I'm dedicated to... Uh, budgeting equitably and fairly and accurately for you. Thank you very much. Kevin, uh, same question. What, what qualifies you to uh, oversee the $300 million budget? They just give it to us in cash. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been involved with budgeting and management for 35 years. I'm on the board, have been on the board of Rogue Community College for 11 years. That's about a $45 million budget. At the university, I managed several million dollars of budgets every year for some 26, well, for about 22 of the 26 years that I was there. 
Uh, I've been involved with state budgeting. I'm the president of the Oregon Community College Association. I meet monthly with the 17 presidents of Oregon's community colleges to talk about how we can use state resources to more effectively serve the students and the citizens of Oregon and the communities that the, commu the communities in which the community colleges are located. Uh, I understand public sector budgeting. And uh, so public Colleen is right, you know, commissioners have to ask the hard questions and commissioners have to be able to understand public sector accounting and they have to be able to look at those records and see if they're really being accurate. But I guess that I would point out that the county budget is audited every year, it's available to everyone in this room. There are no secret parts to the budget, there's nothing hidden, everybody here that wants to find out about it can. And while Colleen is right that commissioners have to ask the hard questions and be receptive to the questions the public wants asked, she implies that there is some hidden part to the county budget, and frankly, I think that that is not the case. All right, next question. Uh, Kevin, you'll start this off also. A lot of talk about uh, climate change out here in the media, talk shows, the world, just always can't uh, seem to uh, avoid anything. Uh, do you believe that this is a serious problem? And uh, if so, or if not, uh, how would it or would not impact your decisions as a Jackson County Commissioner? I believe that there's overwhelming scientific evidence of climate change. The operative question often is, is it caused by human activity or is it a natural phenomenon? And what I would say is, what does it matter? The fact is we all have been experiencing the last few years a different climate than we've experienced previously. We're seeing this worldwide. This was the hottest summer on record. We know that things are going to change going forward if this trend continues, and more than likely it will. And so I think the county commissioners and the county needs to pay attention to this and think about what does it mean if we have less snowpack? What does it mean if we don't have the irrigation water that we currently have because we have less precipitation that's stored and available to us through a snowpack? Uh, you know, today, uh, Kurt Ankerberg and I were out uh, learning about the WISE project, which my opponent uh, apparently doesn't uh, think much of, but this is an effort by the watershed councils, the irrigation districts, the county, the city of Medford, and many agriculturalists to say, yes, we see our climate changing, and we see threats to the irrigation water that makes agriculture viable in Southern Oregon, and we all need to get together, we the people, need to get together through the organizations that we're part of and try to look ahead and say, how could we solve that? And the WISE project has a plan to encapsulate water. In other words, instead of having it evaporate from open canals or be lost, through penetrations to our canals to encapsulate that. And we have the opportunity here with a little bit of strategic planning and investment to increase our water supply about 40%, which incidentally is just about the amount that we're currently getting from the Klamath watershed and that we're in danger of losing. So if we care about our agricultural future here in this county, we really need to pay attention. So that's one example of okay. climate change and how we need to make a change. All right, thank you. Uh, Colleen, the same question. Well, I think there's equally an abundance of information that discredits global warming. Um, Al Gore has been fighting this for years and has been shut down because it wasn't what he said. Um, what I do as a commissioner, I mean, climate changes. Get over it. It, it gets warm, it gets cold. Sometimes we've lived in Prospect over 20 years. One year we had 10 feet of snow. One year we had one foot. And there's nothing you really can do about it. Um, and there's nothing as a commissioner that I think I would even act on. It's, it is with economic concerns and jobs and so many other serious matters in our, our county. Um, I'm not sure how, uh, what I could impose upon you to change the climate. <laughs> as far as the water goes, um, and concerned about the irrigation water, take a look at Gold Hill Irrigation District. Yeah, they were concerned about water, and the government and the special interest groups, environmentalists, shut it off in the middle of growing season. There's just some good 
conservative irrigation, climate change, global warming, done by uh, uh, non-government organizations with threats and grants to make it happen. Just like the WISE project, a $450 billion project to encapsulate all of our water. And if you can say, Mother, may I and pay enough money, you might get some of it maybe back. It, is, it, it will be in federal and state control because it will be owned by us. It will be encapsulated by someone bigger and better with a grant and money, and, and it concerns me greatly why we were blow up dams in the middle of all that, where we had water stored and hydroelectric electric energy. It just is not common sense in my view. Um, we do need to watch our water. We need to be involved in the climate of uh, water that comes over to our town irrigation district. Those are important measures. And I'm not in favor of ignoring our concerns. Turning it over to a federal grant, I am never in favor for. I would weigh it always against our private property okay. rights yeah. okay. and, um, and the citizens. All right. Thank you, Colleen. Next question. We're going to uh, go on a, a news story which was uh, recently announced about, um, about some public land. So this has to do with uh, the area. Would you support, uh, I guess that this will be for you first, uh, Colleen. Would you support all the private ownership land in the area from Tuville State Park along the south bank of the Rogue River to Highway 234 and east to Antioch Road be designated in a new Table Rocks National Monument? It proposed. This is what's been bubbling under the surface in the news lately. Well, I, haven't, I have seen a little bit about Table Rocks being closed off to the citizens, um, and I would not support that, um, nor our national monuments. I am against them closing our public lands and special interest groups like the Nature Conservancy being involved in, in uh, actions like that with um, taking away our access to public lands. It, it usually comes with uh, uh, grants, and, again, and the controls that come with that. I think we need to keep them open, and I will always look for that, fight for that for you. Kevin, your thoughts on uh, these proposals uh, bubbling under the surface for taking the uh, control of the table rocks. This is a new proposal that I have never heard of, so I'm sorry that I've somehow not been part of that discussion. Uh, you know, uh, establishing... Now, Nature's Conservancy does, uh, does manage it right now, from what I understand. The Nature Conservancy has some property on the table rocks, mm -hmm. as does the BLM. Okay. Uh, I have not heard a proposal for a national monument in that area, so it's news to me. We have uh, Jeff Land here who probably could answer that question. But uh, it, it, anyway, uh, you know, I think. Okay, let's it, go with a hypothetical well, then. Any, any, any time that we establish a national monument or a public property for in an area where there has been private property, there, there are concerns, and many times there are legitimate concerns. I mean, I don't think any of this should be done lightly. But, uh, you know, the reason these things are done is to establish a legacy for the next generation so that the people that come after us may perhaps have some of the access to the same things that we had when we came, whether it's a free flowing river or a, a, a part of the country that's wilderness, or in the case of the Table Rocks, there's a lot of history there. So I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm for it or against it without knowing who's affected and, and what happens, but, but I'm not against it on principle. All right, thank you very much. Let's see, I think you will go first. Next question, too? Did I get that right? Okay, it is Kevin. All right, yeah. <laughs> so don't you forget. Okay. Looking from the sides here. Let's go off into uh, Measure 15 119 and GMO questions. Boy, we got a whole bunch of those uh, here at this point. Uh, Kevin, first for you, what is your position on uh, the safety or non safety of genetically modified foods? Just your, your policy. I know that the, what the voters had to say. What is your take on that? Well, the ballot measure was not about the safety or non-safety of genetically modified organisms. The question was, should we grow them here in the county? Mm -hmm. And so that's what the voters decided in May. And then in November, we'll be deciding, should we label GMO products that people are going to consume? In fact, we might make this a two-part question. You could also say, yeah. do you support the labeling? Why right. or why and, not? And th this is great, because I, I, I'd like to think that Colleen and I are pretty much on the same page here. Both of us uh, actively supported the uh, measure in May. And uh, I plan to support labeling in November, and I think she does too, uh, because uh, it, you know, it, people don't people have a right to know what they're eating 
I mean, don't we have a right to understand what the ingredients are and the things we put in our bodies? So that, that just only makes sense to me. Uh, I have personal opinions about uh, GMOs, but, but I guess what I would say is that the policy issues that are before us are not about our personal opinions. Uh, I, I tend to you know, look, look at the scientific findings and uh, my personal opinion is there is, we, we are engaged in a great experiment with genetically modified organisms and what the long-term effects they might have on the food chain and on how it'll affect human health and the health of our planet, uh, the diversity of plants we have, and to some extent, the copywriting of the human genome, or not the human genome, excuse me, plant genomes, and the, uh, a few large, really half a dozen global companies patenting our seeds and preventing the rest of us from passing on the diversity of seeds and crops that we have. So I, I have concerns about it, but I think the policy issues before us right now uh, are, the one in November is labeling and I'm firmly in support of it and I want to congratulate and say how much I admire the people that have worked so hard on these GMO issues. And let's make this a third part, since we're going to get a lot of GMO out in okay. one fell swoop, you don't mind. Uh, will you vigorously enforce 15-119? Uh, if so, when? Or if not, what are your thoughts on that? There have been, uh, uh, Jackson County's been uh, accused of maybe kind of dragging its feet a little bit and getting the word out. I don't know all of the details. If I become a commissioner, I'll know more before I have to make a decision. What I understand now is that there are a small number of uh, alfalfa growers and perhaps a few other agriculturalists who are impacted by this. And it would be my desire not to rigorously enforce the laws at the expense to allow for some transition period to try to let people phase into non-GMO crops. We have to obey the law, whatever that requires, but, but I'm not for going out and trying to you know, test people's alfalfa crops. Uh, you know, these get replaced every four or five years. Uh, so I think that we have an opportunity for some transition, and I, I, I'd like the county to do whatever it can to help uh, people that are impacted right. by this. All right, very good. Colleen, uh, you have the triple bagger for, okay. the, uh, for the GMO the question GMO here. GMO <laughs> Yeah, first off, your, your, um, your basic take on the safety of it, labeling once again, and enforcement. I did uh, rally for the GMO free in Jackson County. I am concerned about the genetic altered foods for our safety. Um, and uh, I'm glad it passed. I mean, it's the will of the people, just like is on the, our mission statement. It's determined by the people. That's why we have a home rule charter, and we can um, rally up what concerns us. I think it's a real niche market for our county to um, to really make cash <laughs> refunds with it. I think we can really do some great things with the organic, um, GMO-free uh, environment we have now. What concerns me, um, yes, I, I, I say that I'm for it, I voted for it, I, I helped gather signatures. But when you look at the questionnaire that we all fill out as candidates, my opponent wrote, it says, do you support growing genetically engineered crops? And he goes, yes. There's a place for GEO crops, but they need to be studied and labeled and sold. So it seems like a counter statement from him, does he support it or does he not? Um, you know where I stand, and uh, I'll be as clear as possible. As far as labeling on the November uh, ballot, <clears throat> I am still looking. He thought I was for it. I am looking. I think it would be a wise thing. We're all label readers. But we have a free market, and if they're growing GMO-free crops, they will label, or GMO-free products, they will label them. It will be a real selling point. But what concerns me my sister has two cows, and she's always fed them this livestock grain. And they eat it. It's full of molasses. They eat it like gangbusters. Until this year, she put it over their uh, hay. They stopped and would not even go in the stall. You want to talk about labeling GMO food and, and uh, feed? She took it back to the grain crop. She says, does this have GMO in it? And they go, we don't know. That's a real point, possibly, that would really sway me, that it needs to be labeled, because when an animal has enough common sense to avoid it, maybe we should, too. Um, and what was the third point about the GMO? Uh, let's see. Uh, enforcement. 
Oh, enforcement. I have heard, you know, the voters voted, we passed a GMO free Jackson County. And from what I understand, it they're dragging their feet and putting it into an ordinance. If anybody moves in this area and wants to be a farmer, it's not documented in the ordinance. And they said, well, we just don't have the money to do that. Well, I think that's what we pay them to do. If we pass an ordinance, as your commissioner, I will see that it's put in the books. Um, that is, meets our mission statement um, as the what the voters decide. We will, we will back and we will put down so everybody knows what has passed and what hasn't. All right, thank you. Uh, Colleen, I believe you're going to keep going for this one. We're going to dip back into economics here for a little bit. A lot of uh, municipalities, some cities, you've heard them, especially on the West Coast, talking about uh, raising the minimum wage, going to a living wage. And so I just kind of wanted to take your temperature. Uh, what is your position? Uh, what do you believe is a reasonable minimum wage for Jackson County workers in favor of uh, raising it? Would you be willing to go off on your own as a commissioner? No. <laughs> I'm a private business. Government needs to stay out of the way. If uh, people can pay more to pay their employees, they should be able to do that. We have a fairly high minimum wage in Oregon. It's tough to pay, and the more you put on businesses, you know who's going who's to pay that? The consumer. The businesses don't, if they can stay in business. And when you see the businesses going out right and left and empty buildings, they, they can't afford it. And I think we really need to consider that. Um, and once again, government in my view, needs to stay out of the way of free markets and free enterprise. Right. Uh, Kevin, do you support the, the uh, minimum wage or any changes in that whatsoever? I'm not aware that the county is uh, about to change the minimum wage in Jackson County or has even contemplated it, so it's kind of news to me. But, but I guess I would, I would say in general, uh, you know, uh, some of you may remember uh, reading in your history about uh, Henry Ford, who created mass production and was paying people on the line, and uh, they were producing cars, but you know, not too many people could afford to buy them, and Henry Ford said, we're gonna increase the wages because we want our workers to have the money to buy the cars that we're producing. And so for many years in this country, we tried to increase wages, we tried to enlarge the middle class, we tried to make it possible for people that were working hard every day to earn a family wage job, to earn a living wage, so that they could buy the things that they were producing where they worked. And I guess that I see the a bit in that, in that notion. You know, if we're just gonna try to hire people on the cheap and pay them money, pay them so little that they cannot afford to buy the products and the services that they're involved in producing, then that seems problematic to me. And Colleen's right, Oregon does have a better than uh, average uh, minimum wage, but the minimum wage is not a family wage, it's not a living wage for most people. And so I, I am, I, am con I, I, I guess that I'd have to see some specifics, but I, but I lean towards saying, let's pay people enough that they can afford to live and participate in the economy, and I believe that that will benefit all of us. Okay. So, Kevin, you'll take the next one here, too, start off. This is kind of a, an offshoot on this. Uh, we have a question here. How do you plan to help small businesses that are already here so that they can grow and hire more people back to also be able to increase uh, employee hours again? Kind of a question, once again, that economic health deal. Yeah, well, <laughs> there are so many things that, that are going on that are collaborative to, to try to help the small businesses. I was involved in establishing the first small business development centers that were set up here in the Rogue Valley by Rogue Community College and Southern Oregon University. I understand that, that uh, capitalization of small businesses is a problem. The SBDCs have uh, tried to do that. We have some money through our collaborative and government-related economic development efforts that help businesses uh, uh, get access to loans at, at reasonable interest rates so they can start businesses. Uh, we try to uh, train employees through through Rogue Community College and through Southern Oregon University and the Oregon uh, Institute of Technology. So that there are a lot of things that that, that we can do to support uh, those small business efforts. I guess I just I, I just have to come back to the fact that there are several hundred businesses in Southern Oregon that have voluntarily put money annually into SoReady, the Southern Oregon Regional Economic Development Organization. 
because they see that's how we're going to support the businesses that we have and attract others. And they're putting that private money in partnership with some public money because we're going to enable our businesses to expand and we're going to attract others here. Colleen? Well, I am a small business owner. <laughs> and um, once again, uh, I believe government isn't the answer. It's people that have a product, a service, willing to work hard uh, and uh, give customer service. There's a lot of aspects to, gov to uh, providing a, a successful business. We've been in business over 20 years and it wasn't the government that did it. it sounds like Obama doesn't, you didn't do it. <laughs> we did it. And it is, it is that philosophy I believe that will help Jackson County. I don't believe it's so ready. I've seen what they've done. We, our government, with your money and mine, gives them thousands of dollars a year. Um, Commissioner Skendrick had a program giving them $150,000 a year, picking winners and losers in the market, um, un, 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 not conditional at all. They could hire people. They were supposed to hire so many people, $2,000 a person, and at a like $35,000 a year wage job. But <clears throat> there was no controls, there was no watchdog over it. Uh, one of the businesses that moved here still is not even registered to do business in Oregon. They left their business registration in California. So there's just lots of uh, problems with government doing things like that. It's the people that do that. And a small business is the backbone of our society. It's what built America strong makes us free, makes us ambitious, and um, I wouldn't expect someone's worked in government all their life to understand that concept, but it's true and it's empowering, and I would be a champion of small business. Okay, uh, Colleen, I wanted to stick with this just for a second on the soul ready, since soul ready was brought up, all right? I think you pretty much answered your opinion on soul ready, pretty much gave it inadvertently while uh, answering this. I wanted to give, um, is there anything else, is this something that you think should be, continued to be supported by uh, Jackson County? Greater rate, about the same, lesser rate. What is your opinion of uh, SoReady, uh, other than what you said already so far? Supported by the county. SoReady being supported by the county. Yes, yeah. Um, I, would, I would look at the contract we have with them. I think they were in one of their work sessions recently wanting more money. They, 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 they need more, just like any government or non-government agency. Um, with their budgets. I would look at that very seriously. Um, they may have a role, and if, if a business wants to go to them for their help, um, they may have a real valuable help to a small business coming from the business side, not from the government side. But I will take a look at the contract the county has with SoReady. Um, I will scrutinize whether more is going to be valuable for the money for your buck and mine. Um, I'm not close-minded to it, I will look closely at it, and uh, I've not seen what they've done being a real measurable of success for us, but um, that's about all I have. All right. Uh, Kevin, why don't you take another whack at the uh, So Ready Apple, uh, you're <laughs> supporting or opposing it, give us your take on So Ready, perhaps embellish <laughs> what you'd started on. Well, I think I already said some things about, about So Ready, which is an uh, organization that's envied by other regions around the state because it has been very effective. But um, I, I just want to get back to talking about s small business. And I especially like to talk about our small value-added agricultural business here in the area. This is the part of our local economy that I'm really excited about. And we have, you know, we, we live in a region where we can grow a lot of different things. We have microclimates, we have irrigation water right now, and we, and we have an opportunity here with the GMO ban to have a unique market niche. I think Colleen and I agree on this. I heard her mention it. Because of this ban, seeds that are produced here will be in demand in many places because we can guarantee that they're organic and that they're GMO free because of this ban. And so there are local seed growers here that, 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 in fact, we may see some move here and make investments because of this GMO ban. We have, you, you don't have to look around very far to see vineyards and wineries springing up. Uh, you don't have to look around very far to see niche food products, whether it's uh, cheesemakers or local bakeries or people making some unique agricultural product. 
And those are small businesses that, in my view, the county really can support. And I, this is kind of a long way of saying, so ready is the kind of organization that can really jump in and help those organizations because they can help them with low interest loans. They can help them with education and training on how to run an effective small business. They can help them on how to market their products. They can network them. And they can do many of the things that small businesses really need. And we, there are hundreds of testimonials from small businesses that have benefited from the kinds of activities that SOREDI is involved in. So I especially want to shout out to the agricultural value-added businesses because that's a part of our, the foundation of our economy that really helps preserve the things value, that we value about this region. If we want to have viable uh, green space, and we want to have orchards, and we want to have these small farms, and we want to have people employed in the agricultural industry, we need to support the organizations that are going to make that happen. And I believe So Ready is one of those. OK, next question, and this is also for you, Kevin. The LNG pipeline that has been uh, talked about uh, going through Jackson County. Is it good for Jackson County, Oregon, the nation, the world? This is what it says here. But anyway, give us your thoughts on that, uh, the property rights involved in the policy. So uh, the, he's talking about the Jordan Cove uh, natural gas export facility in Coos Bay that would have a pipeline coming through Jackson County in part and tunneling under the Rogue River. And so this is a issue that uh, is uh, very interesting because it uh, brings together, on the one hand, environmentalists that are very concerned about the uh, potential for a, the pollution of the Rogue River, one of our greatest uh, natural resources. Uh, if we were to have an earthquake or we were to have uh, leakage in, in, in the pi a pipeline that was under the Rogue River, so the environmentalists are very concerned about that. On the other hand, we have private property owners that are concerned that the pipeline could be, uh, that, that the property for it could be acquired by eminent domain and that their property rights would be infringed on. So we've got property rights activists on one side, environmentalists on the other side opposing this. And then we have, and you know, I, about, a, about two months ago I was over in Coos Bay at, at a economic development conference and I talked to many of the people in Coos Bay that are talking about the Jordan Cove Energy Facility and what it would do for Coos Bay. And they are looking at the potential for hundreds of jobs during a six-year construction project. They're looking at ongoing jobs for people to maintain that. And as we know, our neighboring Coos and Curry counties have been a depressed area. And people are saying this is an opportunity that we have for our community. But we also know that we could get stymied in developing this if, if there's no pipeline built. So um, there are, I guess I see there are pros and cons with this. I haven't taken a, a formal position on this because I, I, I keep thinking if, if Jackson County was Coos Bay. If we had an opportunity here for a lot of employment for people that need jobs, and we had an opportunity to do something we thought our, would help our local economy, would we want a neighboring county to just come out against us and not help our neighbor? It just, there's something about that that's troubling to me. Uh, also, people. Yeah, we're running long. I'm sorry. Uh, well, okay, no. but it's a complicated issue, Bill, and you know, and. It, it's not something that fits a, a soundbite. I, I would say that I'm torn on this issue. I, I'm, I, I share the concerns that people have both on the eminent domain and the environmental concerns. Uh, and I also have a concern that, that natural gas would come from fracking, which to some extent is an unproven technology that could have long-term side effects. So I have some real concerns about this, um, but I haven't formally taken a position. Okay. Uh, Colleen, if you could take a whack at the LNG. I probably don't have near as much to say. <laughs> I am not for it. I think there's a lot of issues with, uh, with the uh, taking of our land, uh, going under our rivers. Uh, it has a lot of problems that I see as, as very um, troubling to the project and to the citizens of Jackson County. All right. Uh, next question, Colleen, you'll uh, start off with this one. 
federal government currently controls more than half of Oregon's land mass. And we talked about these issues here a lot of times, and, and we'll be talking about this and ONC here in the next uh, couple of questions. What is your uh, position, what would your position as a commissioner be with regard to federal control of so much of our local lands? Um, it's very much a goal of mine to get our lands back in our control. I would love to join counties like Klamath County who passed the Lands Transfer Act, a proposal or a resolution that um, all it says is we want them back. And as counties gather steam and momentum together and we all join forces in that and we get a um, conservative governor, maybe we can get those back. They belong to the state. I've been to Ken Ivory's uh, conference on the, his uh, land use uh, plan, it's awesome. And uh, as we see their state maybe have success with it, you know, we can follow that. The Western lands, I have cards, in fact, in my bag back there that shows how much of the land in the West, the East took care of theirs, but the West federal government has taken, still taken ownership of. And according to our constitution, they're supposed to only have 10 square miles of ownership of land in any state. That's constitutionally. So uh, we have every right to take it back as a state. And as county to county, that's where our power and our control start. And it'd be exciting to be a part of that. And I'm really proud of the counties who've taken that step. And I would, I would join hands with them. I told them, that's better than the ice bucket challenge. I'm on. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, what's your take on the uh, control of the Oregon lands? Well, one observation I'd make is that the lands in question uh, are forest lands, uh, BLM or the ONC lands, were never part of Oregon. So th there's a misnomer or a misunderstanding when people talk about taking those back because they were never part of Oregon. These were lands that came a variety of ways through the process of territory and, 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 and statehood. So uh, whether or not they should be under Oregon control or local control is a legitimate issue, but uh, this idea that we're taking back something that we once belonged to the state is frankly just not accurate. And so uh, we, we do have a lot of public land, and uh, in terms of management of that land, there are a couple of product uh, of, of bills in the at the federal level. There's the Wyden effort and the DeFazio Walden effort which are two strategies to try to deal with getting our public lands back into production and reducing some of the fire danger and dealing with things. They, they, these issues are not going to be resolved by county commissioners at the county level. They're going to be resolved to some extent at the state level, but more importantly at the federal level because these are mostly federal land management decisions. And Colleen can advocate for whatever she wants, but, but you, you know, you have to be realistic. It's fine to say, oh, just give us back our lands and that's a, a reasonable policy. Well, I just don't think it's likely to happen. So she can advocate for it, but I think we can be more effective by being knowledgeable lobbyists in Washington, D.C., in coalition with other states and counties, because these are decisions that will be made by federal manager, or actually by the, by the Congress. And uh, we're fortunate, uh, you know, Commissioner Bridenthal has actually uh, developed a lot of expertise in this, has been very active, and I think that we're fortunate in Jackson County to have somebody that's really an advocate for, for Southern Oregon and understands many of these issues. And uh, if I'm uh, elected commissioner, I intend to educate myself and be an advocate for Jackson County, but I'm not gonna advocate for something that I don't believe can realistically happen. All right, uh, Kevin, uh, we'll continue with you here next. And Keying off on that conversation about the federal control of the land, the uh, Federal ONC Act of 1934, I believe it is, is still law of the land. It's still in effect, and these uh, timberlands of the ONC were meant to be managed exclusively for uh, the benefit of the county and for timber sustained uh, timber production. What is your opinion of increasing the cut on these lands? What would you do as commissioner to help make this a reality, since it is the law? Well, we're receiving funds from at least two income streams from these ONC lands that I'm, that I'm aware of right now. 
Uh, one is the uh, payments in lieu of taxes, which is a recognition that federal lands are not paying taxes. So the federal government has been appropriating PILT funds, payment in lieu of taxes. And they've also been uh, uh, appropriating uh, sustainable school funds from, from the timber harvest from these lands. And there, uh, there may be a third revenue stream that, that, that comes to the counties uh, for this. So, so it is important that we try to maintain the forest products infrastructure that, that we have. We have a lot of public investment in that, and so uh, we need to find ways uh, to try to sustain that. It's my own belief that litigating these issues in the courts is not a very effective way to handle land management. And so I think we've got to work on collaboration. The county can be, to some extent, a convener and a moderator between various interests. And I think the county has a chance to try to bring more land into production by trying to get the stakeholders, whether they're the environmental community or private landholders or the federal government, to, to come together and try to say, how can, how can we do responsible and sustainable uh, forest products management? So, so, so I really see us as a moderating role and as a, a lobbyist at the state and federal level for Jackson County. Colleen? Well, once again, my opponent is so confusing. He said he wouldn't advocate for something that couldn't really realistically happen. And then he said he'd moderate and collaborate to see that it did. I, I don't understand that. I will work for having the lands back in our, in our uh, take, caretaking. And you know, um, a federal judge just a year ago ruled that the ONC Land Act be, be, be honored. So. So we're not going to honor a judge's rule? When, when can that happen? Where were our commissioners in coordinating with that judge's order just a year ago? It can happen, and we will, I will advocate for it. It needs to happen, for one, our health, our safety, but for our economy. Do we want to see weed, a, a thing like weed and the city burn up here because of poor land management? And we have started with fire breaks, but the land can be managed. A federal judge has ordered it to be done, and, and I'm not at all wavering on it. I will uh, strive for that for our county. Thank you very much. All right, sorry, I'm doing a little multitasking, and I'm kind of I'm like, which questions, which questions? There's so many of them. There's so many good ones here. All right. Um, why don't we uh, take a little stab back in the, uh, in the GMO world, speaking of judges, all right? We're going to get into this. Uh, if the county, Colleen, were to get sued over the GMO ban, what's your position on defending the measure? Well, it's the will of the people, and I guess that's why we have county council. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, um, and I assume that would be his jurisdiction to protect the county uh, in a court of law. Um, it, our county mission statement, I mean, if we're sued over what the people of Jackson County wants, um, I'm not sure how successful that would be. I stand behind what the county uh, citizens vote for, and um, I'm not for marijuana. We passed legal legalized medical marijuana. and uh, But I will support that. It's what the people of Jackson County voted for. Should we get sued over it? Um, I guess you can sue over anything, but I, we have legal counsel and and it should be his jurisdiction to uh, handle that for us. All right. Captain, what about uh, defending the GMO ban? I don't think it's up to county council to decide if, if he'll defend it. I think it's up to the commissioners to direct council on whether or not he will defend it. And I believe that the voters of Jackson County have spoken, and I think the commissioners should uh, direct the county council to defend the ban if it's challenged. Uh, Kevin, you'll uh, handle this uh, first, crack two. Do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana, uh, marijuana use here? We're going to be voting for that this fall. And how should Jackson County respond to the state versus federal legal conflict? There's another one of these here coming up. Well, let me take the, the second one first. Okay. Uh, the, the, the federal government, in the case of Colorado and Washington, has decided not to uh, try to enforce any federal laws relative to marijuana in those states that have, by plebiscite, decided they want to make it available. So I don't think we're going to be confronted with, with that issue. If we pass it here, I believe that the federal government will make an exception. 
and will uh, not try to uh, make a conflict between federal and state laws. Uh, you know, uh, to me it's not a, a, a really a personal issue. Uh, I guess what I'd say uh, about that is, that I think Colleen and I would agree on this, uh, the voters are going to decide this, and as commissioners, we are going to uphold the law and what the voters decide. Uh, on, a, on a personal level, which I don't think is really the policy issue here, I'd say, how do you think things are working right now, folks, with it being illegal? Not working very well, is it? You know, you think, you really think that the kind of enforcement that we've had is working? We're putting uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people in prison for uh, marijuana. We're, we're spending millions and millions of dollars. We're trying to enforce something that appears to be something people want. And you can't enforce laws if there's no popular support for it. So is legalization the right thing? Could it bring problems? Yeah, it, it, you know, it might bring problems. But I'll tell you, what we're doing right now is not working. Let me make this a two-parter, Kevin, if you don't mind. Should we tax it? Should the county tax it recreationally? Um, I was at the uh, commissioner's meeting a couple of days ago, and uh, they will be, I believe, next Wednesday, uh, bringing forth a, an ordinance to tax both uh, medical and recreational marijuana if the ban uh, passes in the November election. And the goal of doing it right now is that the the November uh, ordinance, uh, or excuse me, the, the November ballot measure, if it's passed, specifically uh, prohibits uh, units of government from taxing or creating any impediments going forward. So the county, like a lot of the cities here in Southern Oregon, is trying to get ahead of it and pass a measure now that might withstand a court test to allow some form of taxation. And I think there's general recognition by the county that there will be some costs associated with legalization of marijuana if it passes. Uh, it could be an enforcement, it could be in regulation. Uh, you know, people aren't sure. But the idea that we should provide some tax revenue to cover the increased costs for the county makes sense to me. And it would be done along the lines of the OLCC, the way we do alcohol. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Colleen, if you could uh, take a stab at the recreational marijuana, do you support this? And would you uh, be in favor of the county taxing it also? Well, and what was the question about the state and federal? Yeah, and uh, what is your... Actually, let me take it. So long ago. Uh, yeah, okay, I know. Uh, do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana, and how should Jackson County respond to the state versus federal potential conflict? Kevin said that he didn't think there was going to be much of one. Well, constitutionally, the federal's government is only given minimal powers, and the rest is given to the states or to the people. Uh, constitutionally, we have the right to, to do whatever we want. Um, personally, I am not for legalizing marijuana. Um, I believe it is, we may have a problem now with it being illegal, legalized. In fact, they're already planning for it. The state is going to tax it, and they're going to provide money for law enforcement and drug rehab. I mean, they, they are creating a problem, and they've already started the solution to try to fix it. Um, no, I'm not for taxing it as well. I was at the commissioner's work session when they first spoke about this. We are behind the curve as far as getting it, like we did the GMO, it was ahead of the, the legislature getting it on the ballot. Well, we did not do that. We, were, we can't get it on the November ballot. So they're going to risk about $100,000 to put up for a vote in March, hoping that things we, we can get it on there, that the, there won't be any challenge to it. I really appreciated Commissioner Rasher, who said he was not for taxing it at all. And I, am, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that's the whole reason they want to legalize it, is for, for financial gain. And um, I just think we're really, I've seen trouble, Colorado's had huge troubles with their legalization program. And why we'd want to legalize it really um, is a sad thing for, for, to me as far as recreational. I think it's going to lead to a lot of, a lot of issues, but um, no tax, and I, I will be voting no. All right. Uh, thank you, Colleen. You're going to take the start on the next one here. Let me just reset my clock here. This has to do, uh, once again, with land and property rights issues, and I'm going to combine uh, a gentleman who I've interviewed in the past with this, uh, this question here, and it has to do uh, 
what would your policy be about supporting amendments to the county zoning presently uh, being reviewed to correct miszoned property? And I would also add, I, I, I'll just bring up the case of Glenn Archambo, who's a you know local, I guess what sheep rancher is that how you would term it? Uh, whatever it is, but uh, suffering an illegal division, and there was an illegal division done on his property decades ago, and he's kind of in a no man's land. And the county says, hey, we're not going to do anything. We can't do anything about it. And yet uh, banks are suing him uh, for uh, uh, an illegal home on the property and all sorts of things. What kind of process, I know it's kind of a broad question, but what kind of a process do you think we can get going to take care of some of these miszoned and uh, uh, bastardized property divisions here under past county administrations? Boy, and it's been decades. I spoke with both uh, Glenn Archambo on his issue. Um, I don't even pretend to have the answer, uh, but I would certainly work with any citizen that has an issue with their private property involving the county or the state. That's what elected officials do. They represent the people. They say, come on in, let's, let's try to get to the bottom of this. And I, I know he's worked at this for um, decades. He's had his property a long time. He, he bought it with a with provision that it was um, divided properly and and he's just got a nightmare. And I know he says commissioners go in and then they can't do anything. <laughs> and I will, I will work my darndest for any citizen that has an issue with their private property involving uh, in any way, shape or form the county and however we can assist him with the state. What do you think about that, Kevin? Well, I know that Colleen is on your program pretty regularly, so no doubt you and she have probably talked about this and you're familiar with the issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah. And actually, I apologize I, for that, yeah. but it, it is something that uh, Glenn was interviewed in the Mail Tribune. It's That's been a right. pretty tough and, deal. And actually, would you be willing to disclose your other connections to Colleen's campaign? Oh, here? yeah, I've disclosed on the air that and, my, um, my wife has uh, been a counsel. Oh, but for a marketing you didn't consult. disclose it to our audience here. No, I've done it on the air several times. I, I, I see. I guess everybody should listen to your program and they'd understand. Uh, I don't listen to it. I'm curious. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, but anyway, be that as it may, that, that's not the reason I asked the question. The question was up here on a piece of uh, paper. All right? Let's have the question one more time. All right, had to do, what would you as a county commissioner do to help solve the problems like a Glenn Archambo? There, he's not the only one. Illegal divisions... They're kind of in no man's land. The state won't do anything. The county won't do anything. They're kind of throwing their hands up. We have people just in having yeah. trouble. Well, Colleen's right that you know the commissioners to some extent are ombuds people or people to go to for people that have problems with the enforcement of our land use laws. And so I think we have a responsibility to listen to those to try to resolve those issues. So. I, I don't know anything about the particulars of this case, but I would certainly be open to listening and seeing if there, there is resolution. I do know that Jackson, Josephine, and Douglas County, under a governor's order, have received an exemption to revisit the zoning of some marginal lands here in Southern Oregon, and this will be true in Josephine and Douglas County, to see if we can resolve some of the problems for land that may have been miszoned. <laughs> And so I don't know if his property falls into that, but if it does, then we should be looking at that and seeing if there's any resolution. All right. Uh, Kevin, you'll take the first one here, uh, first crack at this one, too. Common Core. I have about two or three questions up here on uh, Common Core. Uh, Oregon has already signed on to this, as you know. Even some teachers are kind of questioning this. And let me see if I can get this here. Do you support the recently adopted Common Core standards? And... Um, I guess some educators think it's helpful. Do you think it's actually working for us? I don't know if it's necessarily much of a county no. situation all that much, but I guess people are just trying to figure out where you're coming from on something like that. Well, you know, issues that I haven't studied, I'm reluctant to take a position on. I'd like to think I could be thoughtful and knowledgeable before I take a position. And the, the county, last time I looked, does not administer the school system, uh, K-12. So I would rely upon my colleagues that are on the school boards, upon uh, uh, you know people that are studying this issue, and I try to inform myself before I take a position on that. Okay, very good, uh, Colleen. Well, I have an opinion. <laughs> um, Common Core is um, another federal instilled program that takes away 
that it tells it dictates what we're going to do and takes away local control from our school boards and our local school districts. I am against it. I don't know how we can get it out. Um, I think we need to be on our school boards. You need to be down there in your classrooms. I, I, I did that role many years and uh, fight for your kids' education and for what is going to be best for them. It, it, it isn't a county commissioner purview, but it, I, I've been a parent and I'm a grandparent. Two of my kids, or two of my three, homeschool because one reason is because of Common Core. It is, um, and I think it's against our Fourth Amendment rights. It's very databasing and um, some of the issues. But just, the, just how any federal mandated program does, it controls us because they have the purse strings and they tell us what we're gonna do and it takes away our local control and on that level alone, I'm against it. And as far as the Glen Archambault case, um, he spoke with me, we've been to several meetings together about his situation. I don't think it's anything I've ever spoken on Bill's show about, but it is a, uh, is a, he's a real fighter for his personal rights and I, I speak with a lot of people that fight for their private property rights and I stand with them. I've gone to um, code enforcement hearings with the Sterlings to, for their private property rights. And it's, it's, there's a lot of it in our county, and it it's, shouldn't be. And I will stand for anybody with private property rights. Okay, thank you. Uh, Colleen, a question here submitted. Do you support the current county position of allowing Administrator Danny Jordan to sign contracts up to $5 million without the commissioner's specific approval? This was done a few months ago. I believe Danny Jordan got that power when um, when one of the commissioners was very ill and they could, were having trouble having a quorum. And um, with healthy commissioners, I don't see that as a need. I believe um, Mr. Jordan does a lot of the work that should be done by our commissioners. The commissioners um, probably get a really good break because he takes care of so much. But he's not our elected official, and I believe it. You know, it's, a, it's your elected officials that need to take care of a lot of the contracts. And um, so I would probably strive to maybe reduce that and let him do a, a great job at what he does managing the departments and let the commissioners do the job of doing the contracts and the, the business of the county. Kevin, what do you think about the Danny Jordan's $5 million ability to sign? I, I, I don't think there's any policy. In the, I'd be surprised if there's any policy in the county that blanketly gives Danny Jordan authority to sign a $5 million contract without review by the commissioners. It may have been done in an exception for some reason. I, you know, I don't know. I'll just say a couple things I'm not going to do. You know, I'm not going to say the county is good enough because it's not. There are things that we can improve. We need to look at everything, including the county administrator, and say, can we, can we do it better? Should the commissioners take a more aggressive role? Should they manage the administrator differently? You know, the county commissioners set policy. The administrator carries it out. And if the administrator doesn't carry out the policy of the commissioners, then they need to get rid of that administrator. But I'll tell you the other thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to run against the county, the current and former commissioners, the county administrator, and the county employees as though they were the problem. They are not the problem. Jackson County, of all the counties dependent upon federal timber monies and ONC monies, has done the best job. It's been the most resilient in finding a way to deliver the services that people want here in the county without... Even, even in an era of declining resources. We should be proud of what our county government has done, and we should fix the things that aren't right. But we should not be criticizing people like the county administrator whose creativity as an administrator has led to a lot of savings and a lot of revenue generation that does not put the, all of the expenses of the county on the backs of, of, of taxpayers. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I don't know about this particular situation to which we're referring, but uh, I think the commissioners need to direct the administrator and be responsible for how money is spent in the county. Uh, but I don't think we should be criticizing an outstanding administrator. All right, Kevin, now you'll take uh, your first now again? Okay. okay, I'm getting confused myself. All right. Um, I interviewed uh, Sheriff Mike Winters about this uh, several months ago, and they're already kind of making up some emergency plans. They're, they're looking at what's happening with Josephine, Curry, and Douglas, and, well not Douglas, but uh, Coos County, and uh, just sucking wind financially. And very strong uh, possibility of um, maybe them becoming insolvent. 
what would your plan or what would your opinion be about folding another county, be it Josephine or Curry or some other county that's ailing into Jackson County? Can we take on that? I'm not aware of a plan to fold Josephine or Curry or mm -hmm. Coos County or into. It would be something that would be, I guess I should be more specific. It would be something that probably the state of, of Oregon would more or less say, hey, you know, uh, you know, Commissioner Roberts or Commissioner Talbert, uh, you're going to have to make this work. Well, I don't think the state can unilaterally do that. I, I do think that, you know, you have to be concerned about your neighbors and yeah. what happens in Josephine or Klamath or Curry or Coos County, our neighboring counties, we have to be concerned about. And we should, to the extent we can, we should help. But we can't finance those counties. Uh, but if we have expertise that we can, can help them with, uh, that's probably a good thing. I would offer, though, that, that, you know, if you look around at the kind of small government that, and the tax support for Josephine or Curry or Coos County, if you like the kind of things you see in those counties that are facing bankruptcy, then I think you really need to consider Colleen Roberts as a commissioner. Because if you look at the policy she's advocating for small government, for lack of government intervention, for lack of the effort to try to make things more productive for the citizens of the county. I think that uh, you know you see this in what Colleen is offering. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Colleen? Well, thank you. I recommend that, too. <laughs> and uh, I'm not, uh, if you're talking about criticizing um, our county administrator, we're talking about looking at his $5 million capability of of a contract and that is all and realigning job descriptions and not as a criticism but uh, about joining counties I would really have to look at that um, when you look at the tax rates of these other counties like Josephine County it is it's like less it's a third of what ours is we are at two dollars and a penny they're at 50 some cents and so I don't know how that would uh, would blend in a in a county joining together so I really can't even talk on it I'm not really sure but yeah I do recommend you vote for me and um, we can do a lot with what we have and have the citizens thrive not government everybody says in fact uh, Mr. Talbert said our county's done a great job and our county is doing a great job the citizens are not doing so well and it's the citizens that need to be thriving not the county and uh, that is my goal is to make the citizens and the, the private sector thrive. I have a, I, have, I carry this as a, a little um, demonstration. We have a two page uh, of uh, repossessions from the paper from 2014. That's how well our county's doing. And that shouldn't be. With a county citizenry empowered, this needs to be down to nothing. Okay. Uh, Colleen, a candidate forum has been organized for October 8th to allow county commissioner candidates to present views on issues pertaining to clean energy and climate change. Do you plan to attend or send a representative? If so, why or why not? I, I am not able to go to that um, forum and um, I tried to work it in my schedule and it didn't work. Uh, I was going to send a representative and they weren't able to go, so I am not able to go to that one. Uh, Kevin, you're going to go to that? Yes, I do plan to attend. Uh, climate change is uh, an important issue, perhaps the issue of our time. And uh, anyone in public, a policy making decision in the public sector needs to be prepared to educate themselves about this issue and to be prepared to address it. And next question I would have for you is uh, kind of keying off on that, that same kind of issue uh, with climate change. Are you against or supportive or somewhere in between on a, uh, a carbon tax on, uh, on carbon producing activities. I always hate to take positions on things that I haven't fully uh, studied and, and, and really understand. But you know what I would offer is that uh, we, we are confronted with a uh, increased production of carbon worldwide. It is a, con I believe it is a contributing factor to the change in climate and global warming. It's my own personal opinion. And uh, I think the county uh, really needs to look at its carbon footprint. And so as a commissioner, I would be seeking to engage county employees. I'd be seeking to engage experts in the community. I'd be seeking to engage 
uh, community members in saying, how could we contribute less to the carbon problem? And so I, I, I don't know if a carbon tax is the right answer. It might be. And, and it, it does appear to be one of the few tools out there at a, uh, a state or a national level that really could make a difference. So, you know, I'm sympathetic to it, but uh, I don't think it's going to be decided at the county issue. But I would like to see the county look at its own carbon footprint, look at how we use energy and transportation, look at how we use our water, look at our building codes, look at things that we do that can reduce our carbon footprint. Because, you know, we all have, uh, there are going to be people that come after us. And I think we have to be concerned about the legacy that we're going to leave for them. And I wonder how people are going to, you know, look back on us and say, did we in our time do what we could to make life better for them? Colleen? Well, that's interesting. Once again, this questionnaire, in fact, I have copies back there if you want to see that. My opponent answered, yes, he was for carbon tax and cap and trade and most any other tax. And yet when he talks to you, he says, well, I'm not real sure if I'm for it or not. So you don't know where he stands. I, I will tell you clearly, I'm not for more taxes. I'm not for carbon taxes. I'm not for cap and trade taxes. And um, I answered no in my questionnaire, and I mean no in front of you now. I believe that um, as far as programs that, um, that may affect that, we can look at it. If it's beneficial to the citizens, yeah, we all want clean air, clean water, and managed forests. And you know, our forest manages is a big deal. That, you know, how much carbon goes in our air when we have a big forest fire, we breathe it. And when, when uh, volcanoes erupt, carbon goes in far more than we could ever uh, cure with a plan and a government program and a grant. Um, no, I'm not for taxes. We can't tax fee or find ourselves to prosperity. If we're worried about future generations, will they be able to afford to live here? All right, uh, Colleen, next question here. Uh, we talked about so ready a little earlier in the uh, forum here, and so what, if anything, would you end or change the county's relationship with the Rogue Valley Council of Governments? We're just looking for your feeling on that NGO. Um, in fact, I was going to mention, my opponent mentioned about the uh, rezoning through uh, the Executive Order 1207 that has the opportunity we can rezone. It's Douglas, Josephine, and Jackson County, and that involves Rogue Valley Council and Governments involves LCDC, um, has it, you know what it is? It's a money grab in my view through LCDC, through RV Cog, and the county gets a little bit down the way. And they're on an extension, of course, because they didn't achieve their, their uh, objectives the first go round. So we'll see if they go on another uh, extension to see what they can accomplish. I will monitor what they do. I question RV Cog's role in our government. It's it has uh, got a lot of power. It's a non-government organization. You don't elect them. Uh, they aren't accountable to you, and yet they are involved in a lot of policy in our government. And I will uh, supervise that. I will see to it that, that the policies come from your elected officials and uh, how RV Cog weighs in on that awaits to be seen as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. Uh, Kevin, your thoughts on RV Cog? I think that we're better off to plan together than plan separately and have no plan. And uh, the fact that every city, every municipality, the, ca the county government, every, every body has come together to try to solve the problems that we have in our region, to try to think about what the future will be like, to try to think about the impact of our population doubling in, I don't know, 30 to 50 years, depending on what proje projection we're looking at, and what that means for us. I, th I think that we're fortunate to have a regional body that's trying, you know, Colleen keeps talking about the people. Well, I'd like to know who the people she's talking about because in an, in an issue like regional problem solving, we're involving hundreds, perhaps thousands of Jackson County residents coming to meetings, expressing their opinion. We're trying to collect those opinions. We're trying to arrive at some agreements as a community. And so I think that RV COG as a council of governments can sponsor that regional problem solving, can try to bring people together to anticipate the problems that we have and make them better going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Kevin, uh, next I wanted to just uh, kind of visit the planning department, and we're not here to bag on the county, but uh, I have to say if there's one thing I probably hear more from emails 
you know, people are going, eh, you know, grousing about dealing with the uh, planning commission and trying to expedite pay, planning, and they complain about fees and you know all the rest of it. Now, what is your policy as a, a county commissioner on revamping that, if at all? Well, the, the the county is charged with carrying out state law, and the planning department often is enforcing the state land use laws. And so, when you say what is the policy of the commissioners, I, I say that the commissioners have a responsibility to carry out the laws. If there are performance issues within the planning department, if they are slow in processing applications, if they are not responsible or communicative with the people making applications, if they have misinterpreted the laws that govern them, then the commissioners better be all over that and try to resolve that. But if you're saying, am I going to advocate that the county violate the law? I, I, I would say no, because uh, that can only lead to more expenses that will be borne by the taxpayers of the county, as we've seen in the past. Colleen? Well, the planning department plays a big role in our lives, whether you're trying to add on a deck or build a business, uh, a building, and um, there are state laws, and I'm not for... Um, uh, violating those either but there are county um, fees and restrictions that can be looked at they're limiting our progress I think they're limiting to what um, individuals are able to do in their homes what they're able to do um, as a business um, I have the I have the fee schedule and it's pages long this is county fees not state they the commissioners review them once a year and I look forward to that I want to see what what laws, or what restrictions, what fees are really necessary, and what ones can we get rid of? They raise them every year, and usually from 2012 to 2013, I haven't looked at the 2014, they went up an average of 12%. System development charges went up an average of 10%. Whose wages has kept up with that within a year? They go up every year, and they say, oh, they take some off, but the ones that, that go on and go up far outweigh the ones they remove. And it would be exciting to see a reverse of that and see how that benefits our county when people can build, they go buy material, they hire a builder, and they can look, and then they have a higher assessment on their home, and the county wins there. I mean, there's other ways to look at the benefit to freeing up the people to doing on their property and progressing, and uh, the county benefits, and people go to work. And it's, it's a win-win thing, and I'm anxious to take a look at it. And I will look at it when, when the year rolls around and see what we can do with it. I'm glad you had that. I don't have that, Kevin. No, no, I just saw it for the first time. So. Okay, anyway. All right, very good. Uh, let, let's, say, let's put one more question out there. Then we'll probably go to asking some questions of, of one another. Okay? All right. Colleen, uh, you first. And no person is an island. If either of you are elected, ends up being that you're one of three. What? I mean, how do you reach across the aisle? What, what is your strategy? Because you have to have more than just you to be able to get anything done. What's your strategy? You do. You have to have two of the three. Oh, come on. You have to have two of the three commissioners. Here. I touched a button. Anyway, you have, there, wow. You have to have two of the three commissioners to, to make a change. And... Um, and I may be a lone voice, uh, but they'll hear it. And um, I, I think they need to hear from the private sector. And I am the voice for the people. And um, whether we can merge and get things done, I've seen the commissioners um, blend. I've seen them give their opinions, just like on the taxing marijuana. I love seeing their, they, their freedom to um, say, no, we're not gonna do, I'm not for that, and the passion. And uh, you definitely will have that from me. And whether it, it gets something done, I hope it does. Um, and I just think I, I've years of working in a business. I know how customer service works. I've collaborated with my business. You don't stay in business without working together. And I just have that um, enthusiasm to be able to do that at the county level. How would you reach across the aisle? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I am, I am running as an independent, and uh, I'm a registered Democrat running as an independent against a registered Republican. I mentioned earlier what, why should that matter, but one of the things that's been really encouraging uh, to me is uh, how many Republicans have come forward and said, we're, we're glad you're running, we're, we're glad you're going to, uh, you know, give us an opportunity to have an alternative in November. And uh, I think it's reflective of the fact that I've been out in the community for 30 years working with groups trying to solve problems, whether it's economic development, uh, whether it's telecommunications. Uh, you know, I was one of the leaders of the, uh, that enabled us to give a secure future to Southern Oregon Research and Extension. You know, if you care about 4-H, you care about master gardeners, you care about technical uh, advice to people in agriculture, and you think extension is important, then you have to look for someone like me. And I didn't agree with everybody that worked on that campaign, but you know what? We came together and we won that election. And you know what? The only person, the only person that testified against letting the voters of Jackson County decide if they wanted a secure future for research and extension, for 4-H, for master gardeners, for technical expertise for agriculture. The only person that testified against that is my opponent. All right. At this point, we're going to, I'm just going to speak more loudly. <laughs> nah, it's okay. Who needs a microphone? Uh, anyway, what we're going to do now is allow Kevin and Colleen uh, uh, one or two questions to ask one another. I had seen the agenda here, but thank you for that, Kevin. So, Kevin, we'll have you go first here, and uh, if you were to ask Coley a question, go ahead and fire one at her. Colleen, why, why do you think it is that uh, John Rasher, uh, C.W. Smith, uh, Don Skundrick, you know, are two of our current commissioners, one of our former ones, who are Republicans, uh, John Deason, a former Democratic Commissioner Dave Gilmore, why, why have all of these people come forward to endorse me, and why not you? Well, that's a historic record with Commissioner Skendrick. <laughs> He's always um, has not gone with the Republican, and I don't know why that is. Um, I I look at um, well, I don't know why people go endorse anybody, and I have no clue who John Deason is, but uh, I do look at how we got to this point. And um, in the primary, I won the Republican nomination. I had, was endorsed by the people. And actually, in the Democrat write-in, my opponent got 30 votes, and I got 10 times that amount in his own party. In the Independent Party of Oregon, of which my opponent ran, um, he received one tenth of one percent. It's of, of Oregon. It's I don't even know if anybody in Jackson County received a ballot to vote if he's even uh, had a support from his own county. But it's a independent party of Oregon. They run an online um, independent party primary in July. But um, why uh, we're here, where we're at, is why we're running. And I'm endorsed by the people. I'm proud to have that endorsement. It it. It, one thing that does baffle me is my opponent has um, on his Facebook page a copy of a letter sent to me in the mail by the commissioners, um, and I wonder how I got my mail. But I have, a, I have a copy of that letter in the back, and for anybody who wants to look at it, I was always so hesitant of publishing it. It was so embarrassing for the commissioners to tell a citizen to quit asking questions, and my opponent might not have known that, at that time, I was a correspondent for the Upper Oregon Independent, trying to make a story and get the answers. And, um, and he uh, pro probably was not privy to the fact of my reply to the letter to the commissioners. And so um, I'll give the full letter and the reply to my opponent. I have it in the back for any citizen who would like to read it. But um, I just want to make that public, being as, as a public part of his Facebook page. But I am honored to be your nominee as a Republican and a Democrat nominee for this position. And uh, I'm excited for the race in November. I appreciate your support. All right, uh, Colleen, you can go ahead and ask the question now if you wish. Gosh, I didn't come prepared to ask uh, uh, Kevin a yeah, question. I don't know about that either. You don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> I really don't have one. Okay, all right. 
So at this point, uh, we will just have some closing comments from the candidates. And let's see, Kevin, you went first. So Colleen, you'll go first this time. Well, thanks again for coming. And um, it's clear my opponent and I bring stark differences to this ticket. Um, and by the issues, you can see it's more than a nonpartisan position. There is lots of issues that will affect each and every one of us from a county perspective, from county leadership. Um, my opponent says we agree on many um, proposals and propositions. He agrees with less taxes. He says it's a no-brainer. Yes, he consistently stands for more taxes. And yes, I did testify at a public hearing, as any citizen can, against putting on the ballot the extension for the tax, because I am against taxes. My message is clear, it is consistent. And uh, it wasn't with the will of the people to put it on the ballot, it was a stroke of the pen of the commissioners. If it had gone on with the will of the people, it would have been a little different story. I wouldn't battle that. That's the will of the people. Um, I also testified against the library uh, tax measure as well. It's the right of a citizen to do that, and I would do it uh, anytime I'm against something the commissioners are doing, especially with taxes, when I stand for less taxes. He agrees transparency um, is a necessity in government, and he thinks that um, public meeting laws takes care of it. And yet, if you go to those commissioner meetings, and you dare to disagree, or you have questions, um, you'll see the transparency and the accountability. When you see the, the um, financial measures that are contracted at a certain level, and the supplemental budgets come at another level, where's the transparency there? And so I do ask questions, and I am still reporting for the paper. So it's how you get the answers, and um, we need commissioners open to ask, answer any question, and as your commissioner, I will answer any question, whether you're a reporter, or a citizen, or just a nosy Nelly, I will, I will answer your questions and bring you in. I, as your commissioner, I want you part of the process. This is a government for, of, and by the people, not just at you. And when I, when I encourage people to go to the public hearings, because I have been to about almost every commissioner meeting for the past three years, and when they have public meetings like that affected the veterinarians, when the government was of Jackson County was going to require the veterinarians to report uh, dogs that come in for treatment that, that were not licensed, our veterinarians were not for it. <clears throat> and I spoke to one of our local veterinarians and said, go and testify. He leaves his work, he leaves, drives in there, it didn't any good. And I felt so bad, I called him after, and I said, I am so sorry. And he said, I knew it wouldn't do any good. And I don't want the citizens of Jackson County to think going before their commissioners and airing their views does no good. I want to hear from you, and I want you there. Uh, my opponent thinks that um, the positions should be nonpartisan. And um, I just got to tell you, it's the job of commissioners is not about potholes, roads, dogs, and cats. It's about your life, your life of your kids and your grandkids, and whether it's going to be livable and affordable. Like I say, I've been blessed to uh, raise children without the government in my home. I've been blessed to own property uh, pretty freely. And I've been blessed to have the opportunity to start my own business. And um, I want those same opportunities for uh, our future generations. And it is not accomplished by more government and more taxation and more controls. It's accomplished by a free society. And I believe we can have that again, and it'll take a change of direction. It's with limited government, limited, limited, limited restrictions, and free people, and a vote for me, Colleen Roberts will send that message to our county government for you, and it'd be honored to be your county commissioner. Having some closing comments? Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you to the uh, Freedom Forum for sponsoring the event. Thank you all, I can't believe you sat here for over two hours, it must be deadly. I don't think we're that great. As, that I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we're that good as speakers. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I just can't help making this observation. Uh, you know, Colleen, that you're, you're, you're against government funding on, on principle, 
Oh, except that, oh, those federal funds that come for timber receipts and things like, and the secure rural schools, you, you, you're okay with those government dollars. You're against the WISE project and any regional planning on water issues. Uh, you're against letting the voters decide if they, we should have a tax district for 4-H and master gardeners and technical expertise for agriculture. Uh, you were against, this week, you were against the county accepting some grant dollars to help some pregnant young first-time mothers pair with a nurse practitioner to learn better uh, practices in prenatal care to help them get off their addictions, to try to, uh, when their children are born, to have, have a plan for them to be healthier. And th this is a research-based program that saves the taxpayers thousands of dollars and certainly would have helped those dozen or 15 young women who are struggling. And there was no question in this program about birth control or abortion. These were young women who had already decided to have their children, and you were against it. You are against the accreditation of the health department and an accreditation that might enable the county to save hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant monies that could come here if we had a head accredited health department. You're against regional plannings, you're against regional solutions, you're against the RV COG, you're against So Ready, and you're against, you know, it, it just seems to me you're against most everything. And uh, so I, 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 you know, I do think the voters have a, a choice here. If you believe with someone, if you want to have a commissioner that tries to look ahead, tries to solve problems, tries to build things up and not tear them down, tries to make things better, tries to hold out a hand and work with people with whom he disagrees sometimes, then I, I think, he, I, or I hope, that you will consider me for your vote. Uh, you know, I don't know all the answers. There, this, this is a complex job. The county has complex issues. But I will tell you that I know how to work hard and I have a track record of working with other people to get things done, not just complaining about them. Thank you. Hey folks, I just want to thank you all for coming out and, uh, and, and writing a lot of great questions. There's a lot that um, I didn't get to. Maybe we'll save them for position one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, position one, now we're going to have four people up here instead of just two for that one here in a couple of weeks. But uh, if you could also uh, thank Campaign for Liberty for helping uh, put this event on tonight. You were raising your hand. I didn't know if you were going to do, do a Q&A, &A, but go ahead. Well, I have one question because sure. the Chamber he, By the way, he's a candidate for position one, just so you know. The Chamber of Commerce asked all the candidates if we would support a public-private private partnership to build a new convention center. That's a new, a new project that the Chamber wants. And so I wonder, the two candidates, if they support a public-private partnership to build a new convention center is going to be owned privately. Do you support using tax dollars to build a private building for private owners? Well, I don't know. We weren't really going to be doing a Q&A, but do either of the candidates want to take a stab at this? I don't know. Uh, Kevin? Colleen? I'll just, I'll leave it up to you two. You can answer if you want. People should feel free to go if they've had enough, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Uh, since the time I've been at the university, I've been involved with conferences. I realize that tourism and visitorship is a really important part of our economy. There are lots of businesses, you know, restaurants, motels, uh, people that sell uh, services to tour tourists or people that are, that are here. Uh, it, we really could use a conference center here in Southern Oregon that's larger than the one that we have. It might help some of our local businesses and industry. So in that sense, I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. I don't know the particulars of this. I've told the chamber that, that I'm generally in a, uh, supportive of public-private partnerships because I believe they can return dollars to the region. So my sense of it this, at this time is yes, I am supportive, but I, you, you, we have to see the particulars because as you and I talked about today relative to water, you can't tax people that get no benefit and expect them to be supportive of that. That's not right. And I don't know the details about the convention center either. Um, however, I think if the businesses want one, they should get together and build it. Um, I, the way government can help, remove the restrictions. <laughs> they can make it more easy for everybody to accomplish great things. 